Hello and welcome to the Brooklyn Rails 696 New Social Environment. I'm Carolyn, a Programs Associate here at the Rail, and I have the pleasure and privilege of being your MC today for a conversation featuring Nikki Najumi and Jason Rosenfeld. We are thrilled to welcome poet Natasha Rao here to close today's program. Before we get started, the Brooklyn Rail acknowledges Black Lives Matter and that here in New York, we are on Lenape Hoking, the unceded land and waters of the Wappinger, Canarsie, Muncie, and Lenni Lenape people of the Delaware Nation and Shinnecock Indian Nation. We recognize land acknowledgements are not a replacement for actual necessary decolonial work, but a reminder of place, of the legacies of dispossession and enslavement that sustained and enriched the stolen land we are speaking from. And now to introduce today's guest and host, Contemporary Iranian artist Nikki Najumi has used painting as his primary medium while exploring the relationship between power and violence for over 40 years. Najumi participated in Iran's political revolution and, and as a result was expelled from the country, leading him to become a major driver in building a profound political body of works, taking social power structure and violence as its subject. Najumi's works are in several prominent institutional collections worldwide. Distinguished Chair and Professor of Art History at Marymount Manhattan College, Jason Rosenfeld, PhD, has curated the exhibitions John Everett Millay, Pre-Raphaelites, Victorian Avant-Garde, and River Crossings. He is co-author of the monograph Cecily Brown and a senior writer and editor at large here at the Brooklyn Rail. Thank you all so much for joining, and I'm going to pass it over to you, Jason. Thank you very much. Great to see everyone here today. Welcome on this Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, we have a great conversation, I hope, for you today with Nikki um, about his really wonderful and intriguing show uh, that's on right now. We're going to talk about uh, just a few thank yous first. Thank you, Nikki, for joining us. How are you feeling today? I'm good, thank you. Thank you for being here. Good. Nick is coming to us live from uh, Greenpoint in Brooklyn. And Natasha is near Princeton, New Jersey, and I'm coming to you live from the West Village with a menagerie of cats who show up once in a while. Um, and uh, this is our 696th new social environment since March of 2020. And shout out to GE. Uh, we have now tied A-Rod, Alex Rodriguez, on the home run list, all-time home runs, 696. And we are approaching Albert Pujols at 703. That's my little baseball connection, as I always do. But we also have other sports to talk about today, which we will, with Nikki. That is football, the World Cup. Of course, uh, Iran and the United States both suffered setbacks yesterday. We'll delve into that a little bit. And then, of course, the clash between the two nations comes on Tuesday, um, but the political implications of all these are quite interesting. So we'll weave that into our discussion. So thank you to Helena uh, Anrather and the gallery down on the Bowery. Um, thank you to uh, Tiani at the gallery, who was very helpful when I went to visit. Thanks, of course, to Chloe and Carolyn and the whole team at the rail. Uh, and Fong, a little plug also to get to Craig F. Star Gallery at 5 East 73rd Street to see Fong's beautiful show. Uh, symphonies and meditations uh, which is up through january 28th of next year so let's launch in and i will start the share we'll show you some of nikki's stuff good so you can follow nikki on instagram at that handle that you see there And here is the exhibit, which is up right now at 132 Bowery, um, Helena uh, Ann Rather Gallery, and uh, it's called 1981, which is the year of all the pictures which are in the show, all the paintings which are in the show. There are kind of two suites of paintings, one series of large works in the big front room, and then a series of smaller works, which we'll discuss in the rear room. And I should just note everything that I'm showing you today and that Nikki and I are showing you today from the exhibit, everything is oil on canvas. So 
and then also just want to mention that um, he also had a show very recently, right, in London um, at Tamor Grana Projects titled Tales of the Lost Dreams. Um, and I see I misspelled tales at the top. Apologize for that. Should be T-A-I-L-S, I think. Um, that was in Holland Park in London, and it closed in October of uh, this, this same year. Um, there were paintings in there, and then there's a really uh, beautiful suite, it looks like, of these intriguing flower pictures. Um, maybe, Nikki, can you just talk a little bit about this, this show, and then we'll go back to, and look at some of the earlier stuff? Um, this was the latest uh, show in uh, Tamil Gallery you know, about a couple of months ago, and consists of four large paintings and about 10 smaller paintings, which was uh, some of them, like the big one that you see here, is a, is a continuation of uh, what I used to do. Uh, and I'm, I'm still doing, which is um, has a political connotation to it. Um, the rest of them are also, the small one is the uh, first uh, experiment that I did with the flowers and continuation of the series of the work that I did a year ago uh, about the environment. Uh, so that was it about the what sorry what was that the... but about the environment oh the environment okay and are the flowers uh works that you did in oil they're from life or are they sort of imaginary studies the the environment the previous one that i did was a huge large scale uh, painting about trees that has been planted, that has been burned or destroyed. Mm -hmm. So the, the small flowers is a continuation of the same series, but the, these are the flowers that I, for some reason, they came to the, to the studio and I kept them for some time to get dry and brown. It, was, mm -hmm. it wasn't fresh flower that I did. So I, I kind of symbolize it as a continuation of the, you know, decaying the environment. That's right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And do you feel, you know, what is the relation you think between these and then the, the remainder of the works, which are largely sort of large scale, you see an example there on the screen, larger scale works, uh, which are figurative um, and, you know, it have uh, all different kinds of colors and gestures and different material um, and, uh, and sort of a collage of elements. I mean, how, how do you see them in, in terms of their relationships with the larger, more sort of historical work? Right. I, th I thought uh, I did those works, uh, figurative work for a long time. So mm -hmm. it was time for me uh, to move uh, and those those large works has a political as I mentioned has a political combination between uh, actually it was a reality and imagination combination of those two two elements together mm -hmm. uh, then I moved to the environment I think at the time when President Trump, was talking about uh, environment that, that nothing wrong, everything's okay, things like that. Whereas we know that the environment is one of the big issues uh, for the future and is decaying. Uh, so I, I touched upon that subject and that subject inherently has the political message. So there, these works connect to each other by that political message. Mm. Gotcha. Okay, interesting. All right, well, well, we'll explore some of that as we go through. Just to, you know, I don't think there's any way that we can cover your whole career in this short talk, but for but, people who are 
less familiar with your work, maybe just show a few things I thought from your more recent work and then have that as a kind of baseline so that we can go back and look at the present show of works from 1981 and kind of understand it um, through that sort of lens. So I put up here just a couple of uh, examples of your more recent work in the last two decades on the left is the cover of the Brooklyn Rail in which Fong uh, interviewed you in November uh, 2010. And on the right is a uh, work called Invasive Personality from 2015, which was in a show at Haymore Grana Gallery in New York uh, in 2016, which was reviewed by our own Yassi Alipur in The Rail. So, you know, the kind of work that you've been doing over the last decade, um, large scale paintings like the one on the right, sort of collaged elements. I understand this is a landscape from somewhere in uh, Portugal, maybe, is that right? Yeah, probably, I'm not sure. I, yeah. I took it from a newspaper. I was yeah. fascinated by the, by the dense, dense, density of the landscape. And I, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, I kind of blend the reality with the, with the imagination here is a beautiful landscape. But at the back of it, you see the explosion and all the things that is going on. I think mm -hmm. that is the time of uh, war, also between uh, war in the Iraq, and, uh, Afghanistan, and and this guy is also is symbolic. Uh, the the red thing is kind of. Uh, what you call grenade that is going to launch on the back of the landscape. So there is oh, some- that he's holding. Right, that's some, uh, there is some indication of the relationship between these elements. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I thought I read that as a kind of balloon, but grenade makes, it makes is, sense. It is a balloon, yeah. but right. I meant it to be. Yeah, yeah. So you can see a little bit of how Nikki works here, where there's a combination of found imagery, photographs from newspapers. There's a great deal of drawing, as you can see in the image on the left, uh, multiplied with painting, collaging of elements. And then I wanna point out to people this really interesting element, because here we're talking about media, collage, working on surfaces, you know, flat work, but then these kinds of dislocations of the body, which you can see here, the pant legs, which are a little bit off register with the body. And nicely, I noticed that our uh, designers at the rail did that to the initials BR on the top of the your cover. Of course, we have a different cover for each artist interviewed in the issues. Um, and that kind of makes me think of sort of herky-jerky uh, video and, uh, you know, sort of, uh, miss, you know, missed forms and and uh, the idea of a kind of multimedia presentation, which is put in there, and then you dovetail it with these Harlequin designs and colors, which you know date back, as as you know, to Vato and to Picasso, and the idea of the artist or performer um, on the canvas or or in the space of the space of the the canvas, and these things all sort of coming together in these works, it's really intricate. But these these dislocations. This is something that you started to do in your paintings around when. Um, this is the also beginning of the war uh, between the United States and Iraq, mm -hmm. and the um, road um, along the road. There was a lot of explosion and a lot of body body parts around the around that area. So my thinking was, I, I was interested to do something about it, but I didn't want to, didn't want to show the reality as it is. So I was, mm -hmm. uh, I came up with this uh, thinking that, how about if I, I cut it, I cut the body in a way that is displaced, disoriented, mm -hmm. so that, might uh, you know refer the body is a different thing. It's, it's not uh, in the war is a 
is a different part of it. It's not mm -hmm. the same. Right. And then the, the effect on the body and then the idea of the body politic, because this face here is that of the Ayatollah Khomeini, who is sitting here yes. and in, being offered a frog. So there's, there's despair, but there's also a little bit of humor, I feel, in some of these works. That's, um, that's also, if you, I, I also use a mechanism of, uh, there is nothing in the body except, um, you know, something like wire. When you, when you make a statue, sculpture, inside it, you put up this all, all wiring and everything else. So I put the body of uh, Khamenei as there is nothing in there, just uh, just the wire. Uh, and as you mentioned correctly, um, the guy is giving him humor, uh, giving him uh, this uh, uh, frog as a, as a kind of humor that uh, there was nothing mm -hmm. so it's about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then, in addition, you're using a sort of pointillism here with dots. Mm -hmm. um, so there's this idea, uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar with the work, where there's this sort of continuous access to the Western tradition of paintings, whether it's Picasso um, or Seurat, uh, dovetailed with contemporary images and you know contemporary history of the moment in these pictures, which you know makes for a sort of radical intervention into the whole idea of history painting, I think that runs through your work. Exactly, right. So this was a show from two years ago at the same gallery, although I, this was at her earlier location down in Chinatown, uh, Helena Anrather from 2020 called New York Times Sketchbooks, 1996 to 1999, where these uh, wonderful and uh, elusive and uh, sometimes uh, richly sort of sardonic and, and humorous drawings that you did on the opened up broadsheet of the New York Times, which you can see a detail um, here. Uh, was this some, uh, something that you decided in an Ankawara kind of way to do this every day, to do a drawing every single day on the face of the paper? Yeah, I, actually, I uh, one day, I think probably in 1996, usually I have a stack of paper in, in the drawer or around me whenever I want to do something I could, um, you know, I could just pick up one and start working. One of those, mm -hmm. I, one of those days, I look around and, and didn't find any paper. So, also, I I used to go to go out early morning and and buy the paper and bring it home and read it. So, I thought, why not? I should do it on the paper. Not that it's a serious thing. I just it's a matter of doodling and see what happens, you know. So I start mm -hmm. working real, nothing really important, just just do some some drawing. By the afternoon, I look at the drawing and said, it's not really too bad. Maybe I should do something else with the, with the newspaper. And I knew a lot of people has worked on the paper as the, from the Kunin to the, to the rest, recent artists, everybody worked on the paper too. So I said, fine. Um, after a few days, I realized these are okay work. And the best way I, to, I should do it is uh, I put them on the front page and make a series of it. So the other element that I, I, I was working on this, none of them had any, pre, any previous conception of work that I, I usually do. I usually work on the small size and study uh, to realize uh, what am I going to do on the large paintings. So these were the one that I didn't do I didn't have any preconception or anything. I just start freehand doing whatever I want to do with the uh, with the drawing. So mm -hmm. it become 
customary for me to do it every day when I get the paper, when I read, when I finish the reading, then I go to the first page, whatever I have the feeling about, I will put it on the, on the front page. I did it for three years. And that, that was a lot of, uh, a lot of work and a lot of them are also not good. I wish I got rid of it, but some of them, or most of them, remained. And um, Elena was generous enough, and she had the vision to realize that we can have a show with this. Yeah. Well, I think that's you know part of the practice, right? Is the the kind of rigor of it is. is not necessarily in the drawings themselves, but in the doing every single day, committing right. yourself to it. So uh, at what point, I'm interested, at what point did you decide you were done? I think by second year, I start slowing down. I thought <laughs> I don't have any, I said whatever I want to say on this, there was nothing yeah. more. So it got yeah. slower and slower by the third year. I wouldn't do it like every day, probably right. once a week. Then by the end of that year, I totally stopped. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned de Kooning and of course Picasso worked on papers, but other other artists like, you know, contemporary artists, Tatiana Trouvé uh, had a show at Gagosian in 2021 from March to May where she, Right. drawing on these on the papers and Wade Guyton of course always has been working with papers for a long time so you continued and then restarted a trend maybe with these kinds with these kinds of works I haven't I haven't done much really but the, <laughs> as you know I know countries does it too now yeah on the yeah. Book, it's also beautiful yeah so the most recent show in New York City was um, featured these two works. It was at Helena uh, and rather uh, from 2021. Um, and it was reviewed by Andrew Wilbright in The Rail. And um, here are two of the most recent works from that show, Mountain Climber on the left, Ink and Gouache, and We the Witnesses on the right from 2021, uh, where we see the kind of, you know, things that you're doing recently where there's a real overlay of material um, the sort of in shadowy or you know, outlined female figure on the left over this sort of uh, ink wash um, drawing of, of mountains. And then on the right, these extraordinary uh, conflagrations of forms um, that are, you know, I think of these as a, a kind of modern history painting. I'm someone who trained in historical art and 19th century art um, and tracing the idea of history painting in the 20th, 21st century. I think is really interesting. It sort of ramps up again in the work of Robert Rauschenberg and his combines, which I think are a kind of history painting for the post-war era and have very little to do with high modernism, whatever that is. But I think you're continuing in this sort of trend of working with imagery, found imagery, and you know, a kind of uh, truncated, but also suggested narrative, I would say in these paintings. And I should just note for people who are looking that these are different sizes. The one on the right is quite large. Okay. On the, on the left, on the right side, the, the large painting is interesting because I usually, uh, I have the clips of newspaper from magazine newspaper and cut them out and put them on the, on the smaller book, like the left side, exactly. So in order to understand how they look at compositionally and if it worked, if I put it on the larger, larger scale of painting. So I make this smaller one, but usually was, there's one, one image, which is, for example, these two guys fighting, there was a painting on that two image years ago. But recently, through when I have looking for the image, 
some of sometimes these images lay over each other without my decision, without, without my intervention. This was one of the things that happened. There are like combination of three, four images on top of each other. And then it gave me an idea what if I do all of them together rather than pick up one image. And that's what we got, which is a, becoming a complex painting, combining three, four images, which totally, I was disoriented when I finished it. So <laughs> it, that, that become a motive for me to continue it. Right, that's and honest. <laughs> and I, as you said, also uh, the other elements uh, like uh, um, Picasso and other people usually seen that you can see part of it. Right, yeah, it's interesting that it could disorient yourself because, you know, looking at We the Witnesses on the right, you have the, the figures, sorry, the top are sort of vertically oriented. The guy at the bottom is horizontal as if a landscape, but then there is that landscape on the right side, uh, which really throws you for a loop. And then all these sort of almost like torn elements, which as you can see, when you look at the uh, maquette here on the left, the photocopy, the mixed media, are these actually cutouts um, of these figures who have been then twisted. It's, it's very complicated. And then to translate that into painting is, is quite a feat. And then uh, these sort of di bodily dislocations, which we were talking about, which now become, I think they look quite violent here, right. these sort of gouges, you know, and I, I, you, you spoke about that, the idea that these are, these are uh, metaphors for the, the, the right. damage to humanity in the war. And it looks blood splattered as well. I find this to be a really interesting image. We're going to come back to it at the end, especially the way you put like the green lantern um, mask on the uh, on this guy who's sort of floating there in the air in space. It's like a Christopher Nolan movie gone even more crazy, these kinds of painting. Thank you, that was good. <laughs> so here, let's have a look at this current show. Hopefully that gives people a sense of what you're doing now. Um, but the current show at Helen and rather 132 Bowery, uh, great location downtown, go get lunch at Great New York Noodle Town and then head up to see Nikki's show. Um, each work in the front room is around 71 by 50 inches. They're all from 1981 and all oil on canvas. So here's a view of the front of the gallery with this uh, amazing window, right? It's great. I love this window here because you see, you see the world, you know, and then it makes you think about the paintings in a different way. And then they've stripped the ceiling down bare um, uh, to its sort of wood beam, wood beams uh, top, and then retain the white walls. It's a little bit of a postmodern gesture, I think, in the design. And there's very beautiful smelling, uh, beautiful and good smelling flowers in the back. So here are some of the works in the front room, and we'll just look at a couple of these larger oil paintings and talk about where you were in 1981. So you were born, we established in 1941 in Iran. And um, you had family who were artists, I understand. And then you decided from an early age, you wanted to go to art, uh, be an artist, go to art school. Um, and uh, were, 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 was working in the um, University of Fine Arts in Tehran. And you got your Bachelor of Arts there in 1967. And then you somehow find your way to New York. But I'm... Then, Actually, I had a scholarship after the graduation from Tehran University. I had the scholarship to go to Paris to study for two years in Beaux Arts in Paris. But that was 1970, 1968. And mm -hmm. I'm sure you're familiar with what happened in 1968. It was a student rebellious against the government of Paris and right. they 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 cut off all the scholarships so like I I couldn't go there. So the next step for me was to come to New York 
Uh, New York was the place that I'm usually af afraid of, you know, everybody afraid of, because we didn't have any idea what's, what's happening in New York. With Paris, we were, we were much more familiar because of um, impressionists and Picasso, everything, everything in Paris we knew about. So mm -hmm. ideal point was to go to Paris, but then I had to come to New York and change the course. But in New York, I, uh, so I didn't know any English. I started learning English at the beginning. Then I enrolled, enrolled in the um, meantime, I got involved with the Iranian Student Association, which was a political organization at that time working for uh, freedom of speech and freedom, uh, freedom of political prisoner in, in Iran. They were very active and I got involved with them. Just, this is also during the time of Vietnam War in, in the United States. Lots of uh, uh, demonstration lots of fighting was going on and we are the student Iranian student were part of it we did we worked with the American student uh, organization in, in Columbia New York University and school of social New York school for social uh, social research so we were close closely related those two struggled together. And by 72, I enrolled in uh, City College to, uh, to get the Master of Fine Arts. And by 1974, I graduated and right away I went back to Iran to, to start working as a teacher in Tehran University. But then I was called by the secret police, so up at that time and interrogated for almost two years, not physically, but uh, just talking uh, mm -hmm. every day. <laughs> every other day, they, they would ask me to go there and talk. And finally, they decided that I should not, I was forbidden to, to teach in any cultural center in Iran and work in Iran, just they allowed me to have a show in Iran. And that's why I start going to Iran once a year, have a show for myself and one show for my wife at that time. So mm -hmm. that was the brief. Uh, into the late 70s. So in, late when 70s. you were when you were studying in Iran before you came to New York in the late 1960s, was the uh, art education uh, a Western based art education and one that was pretty much focused, as it seems, on Parisian modernism? And then you came to New York and was that when you first saw the New York school, abstract expressionism, et cetera? Right. In Iran, our problem was about the, uh, it, it was following the rules and regulation of uh, Beaux Arts, the School of Art in Paris. Nothing okay. modernism, nothing, nothing like that was happening. So we knew a little bit of the United States, not much. Mm -hmm. uh, by the time I got to New York, then I, you know, not at the beginning, but because at the beginning I start um, this, uh, I start being member of the Iranian Student Association for an, for almost two three years. I didn't do any painting. I didn't go after it. So mm -hmm. after after I decided to go to City College for Master of Fine Art, then I. I become much more aware of what what is happening in the United States, and I realize there is the Kunin. I realize there is uh, 
you know, Jackson Pollock and you know, Expressionism in the United States. Mm. But at the school, my concern was, uh, and I would ask all the teacher, uh, if, yeah, any chances that I get, uh, I would ask what is the relationship between art and politics? And, um, and they would they would really look at me strangely. They, they didn't know what, exactly what, what was the question and what was, uh, what was I, I was looking for. So, mm -hmm. but I, my did I, my, I, I did my homework. I did a lot of uh, expressionistic <laughs> work, minimalist work as the school required. Mm -hmm. huh. And then when you went back to Tehran and you were, you were exhibiting frequently in the 1970s, did the works that you were making, and I understand most of them are now lost because they were confiscated by the state after the revolution, did they have a similar style to what we're looking at here from 1981? There are, there are other things happened in between, between 1974 to 1978. Mm -hmm. I, I, got, I got a commission by a cultural center of Iran to illustrate a book uh, about the prophet Monic prophet Manichism in Iran, which was probably third century. He is the only prophet that his book was painting. It wasn't written book, it was a painting book. So uh, there is not much left of it. Mm. But I, his idea was there is a two, there is duality in, in the life. One is light, one is the god of light, one is the god of the darkness. So the darkness is surrounding the light. Our duty as a human being is to, uh, to free the light from the darkness. Then we, all of us, we are free. So because my, my work has this kind of relationship between, uh, between the dark and the light, they decided I should do the, um, I should do the, the illustration. So I did about 480 illustrations for that group. In that, in that year of work, I did five kind of experiments with the illustration and part of it was based on miniature. These things that, that I'm saying to you because this work that you see right now on the, on the screen is coming after those work. You can see yeah. there are the influences of the miniature. You, you're seeing the influences of the 19th century the, uh, lithograph of Iran, 19th century in, in Iran. So I, there was a con and I combined it with the reality of the day. So there is, a, for example, the view of the garden is based on the miniature, it's all landscape of miniature. Then there is a reality happening in that landscape. So those are, these are the base of that experiment that I did and, and it still continue, but the point I'm trying to make is um, at that time, one thing was important for the, all the Iranian artists was how to identify our, ourselves as Iranian artists. So one element, one way to do it was to do the calligraphy. And the other way was to take the elements of the past Iranian work and combine it with the, whatever you do right now. And that's what I, I did in a way. I picked up the elements that I thought is working and put them in the, in the world. And later on, later on, I got rid of everything and I made it much more uh, clear as one approach to the work. Mm -hmm. Well, we've been looking at earlier. 
So when you say the works, the elements which seem like lithographs, and here on the left is the large view of this painting, garden view, and just a right. couple of details here on the right, right. Uh, that these black and white works resemble 19th century lithography, prints made off of stones uh, using ink and oil. Um, are these images, though, that you lifted from uh, publications, newspapers, magazines? Is that part exactly. of that practice? Exactly. If you look at this too, uh, you probably recognize them if you look carefully. This is uh, this is Reagan. Yeah. And here, I think Mr. Walker was the was the ambassador of United States in uh, United Nations. So. Okay. And the, and the painting done in 1981 is right at the time of the, of the Reagan. So yeah, that's why I, I picked up the, I picked up as usual, I picked up the uh, images from newspaper and combined it to mm -hmm. whatever I was and the, working on. And the donkey is of course the symbol of the other party, the Democrats the party. and Carter who had just lost and of course had lost uh, because of his botched, um, well, part reason, botched raid in, in Iran um, related to the revolution and the hostages yeah. that then were freed under Reagan. Um, and then you see this element here you would describe as something related to the miniatures. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. I think I have another, some other details. I and mean, this person who, you know, when you combine it with the landscape in the background, looks like they're going to be hung from the tree. And then this very sensitive sort of image of this woman struggling with a cane, um, walking through this sort of you know, you know, um, you know, Beckett-like landscape, this blasted landscape here in the background. Um, the other painting that I just showed before, that this is also a fabulously jumbled and trenchant work. The impulse here is the full painting on the right and on the left are two details. Uh, from this work. And, you know, when I look at it with my art historical eye, I, I see a lot of things, and then you can correct me. But um, this looks like the head of uh, Dante from um, Raphael's School of Athens. Uh, these forms here resemble the elements that you see in Kandinsky's improvisations from uh, his early abstract period. Uh, then you have, you know, again, these sort of clipped images from regular sources. This one of these huddled figures from Picasso's blue period, which you see frequently in his more morose paintings after the death of Casa Jamas. And then, you know, this amazing image of this uh, person who looks like uh, a young, a kid who's uh, then sort of disturbingly hanging upside down. Although on the other hand, you could read the kid as like hanging from a, the monkey bars in a, in a jungle gym. So the complications are what give it the complexity that gives it a real power, I would say. Okay, let me, I have to also mention uh, mm -hmm. this is 1981 and I was in, um, I was in Tehran during the revolution from 19, 1978 to 1980s. Mm -hmm. So it was every day in, I was in, you know, huge demonstration every day, every day. So by the time I came to the United States, there was nothing. I was so quiet in, in Miami. There was really, um, I was like empty. And I was going to do the painting. So this is my mm -hmm. daughter, Sarah. And mm -hmm. this is a photo of uh, Nahid, my ex-wife. So she's in this, this one. This That's one. this figure, right? So okay, I use them a lot during this uh, series because they were available. I could take a picture and put them in, in the painting. But at the yeah. same time, I was so disappointed, so uncomfortable that I didn't. I was disappointed at the. Uh, the way that the revolution was going, it was not in our liking. 
you know, it was, it went mm. toward exclusively the cleric regime. And that was, uh, that was not, I did not like it. And I was so disappointed that uh, I started doing this painting that mostly shows a lot of a lot of different things that represent that this uh, this pleasure and with the with the revolution. So mm -hmm. let me tell you this element that you see. As I said, I took it from the Iranian miniature, which the hills is portrayed like this. And this part? Of, right, this, this things that happening here. Okay. And, the, and the trees and the hills, yeah. all these things based and the horse. All this okay. is based on uh, uh, Iranian miniature, but I did it in a way that it didn't, it shouldn't look like it. It was just, I took it and put it in the way I painted. So that, mm. that's what, and, and I, in, in, a, in a way to, to show my disappointment to the revolution, this, uh, this is Sarah, and she was about seven, eight years old at that time. Oh, here. I put, yeah. her, I put her coming down in a, in, in reference to to our to our revolution that is going down it's not it's not something that is uh, is going to be in the right direction so most of the most of the painting actually uh, in way way in one way or the other show this 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 dissatisfaction and uh, with the revolution, the mm -hmm. revolution was going. And you're painting these, and here's another one uh, here, um, which is called Red Gate from 1981. You're yes. painting these in Miami Beach, right? You yes. moved to Miami Beach, left yes. Tehran, moved to Miami Beach. Um, but you're, it doesn't feel like you are really responding to this different atmosphere in Florida, the light the air, the ocean, uh, that there is a real, you know, morose kind of color scheme yes. that you're using here. Um, but is this a change from the palette that you had been using in your previous work before you left Iran? I think the series work that I did in Iran, which was uh, still in the Museum of uh, Contemporary Art in Tehran, uh, they didn't give it to me, and I'm still trying to to get it back. It's a, it was about 100, 125 painting and drawing. Uh, this is continuation of the same thing. Okay. Remember, is I was one of the artists at the right at the beginning, which I did a lot of painting about revolution, but didn't didn't praise the revolution. I had the critical attitude towards it. And that's mm -hmm. why they, you know, they wrote about it and they, I had to, to get out of it as soon as possible and the, the painting. So this painting that you see is a continuation of that palette, continuation of that disappointment. And you see it here happening. I couldn't get into the beautiful beach of Miami and you know those fantastic yeah. landscapes. So whatever you see is totally go back. My mind was there. Go back to that situation, and whatever I painted, it came out really kind of uh, gloomy and not very happy painting. Yeah. I can see, and the other, and things that I noticed, like this figure. This is your ex-wife again. No, this, this is one? Sarah. This is uh, this is Sarah. It's hard to tell. They look alike. Um, okay. The uh, the the tonality, the pose is very similar. 
to the kind of works that Picasso was doing between the wars that returned to classicism with right. that sort of chalky, chalky Caucasian flesh tones. And then you have also these sort of jumbled acrobatic bodies, which is certainly part of Picasso from the Charnel House. Um, and uh, I'm interested in this, uh, the gate. What is that a particular reference, Nikki? This, this red is, gate? This is a, exactly copy the gate that is in one of the miniatures. Okay. Uh, the gate is in there, and around the gate, there are multiple stories going on. And here yeah. is the gate and multiple stories going on, but the stories are totally contemporary and related to revolution. The group yeah. of the group of people that you see um, and here is all related to to the revolution when they they escape. You know, there were at one at one point I was in one demonstration after revolution. This was the first demonstration that seven died. I was in it, and the, at the time when we just ran out of, ran from the uh, revolutionary guards and tear gas on all the scene, hmm. jumbled, top, yeah. went over each other in order to escape the thing. Yeah, true chaos. Okay. And then that is a little bit reflected in, people should notice these kind of demarcations in the canvas, which you'll see frequently in this work from 1981. It's not it's not quite the off-register material that I just showed earlier from the last decade or so, but it seems like this is where it's kind of heading, these kind of lines of incident. And then uh, the colors shift, maybe the registration doesn't shift, but the colors shift. And then of course you have more of these sort of disembodied forms who are jumbled and upside down, the world gone topsy-turvy. Okay. Yeah. This, and, and people people should know these are these are pretty extraordinary paintings in terms of the gesture you mentioned before expressionism of course this is a period 1981 when neo-expressionism is sort of ascendant in uh what painting was going on in new york and also in europe and it has that kind of uh vibrancy in terms of the use of the brush if not the kind of brightness of the palette let me tell you a little bit about this uh, thing this, okay in manuscript uh, in Iranian poetry, there are division like this, like three, four of them. And mm -hmm. inside this division is written poetry. And the main center of the work is a painting or miniature. So I use this in a lot of illustration that I did, and I use straight color without any writing. So you could see like two, three rectangular without any writing, all with different color in the composition of the painting. In mm -hmm. most of the painting you see, and at the end I use it I use only one line, make two division, one top, one bottom, and make two reality, or one reality down and the other reality on top. Well, here you can see there is two colors. Yeah, yeah, uh, in the upper section. Right, yeah. so these yeah. are the beginning of that series work that I use uh, to do, and. And you know, in American painting, a lot of people also using that division. Right. This compart, uh, this compart, you know, making it into different uh, different sections. And then, you know, that my eye looks at these elements here as sort of continuing that perpendicularity, which runs through the work. There's a real, there's a kind of subtle grittedness which I see in these paintings, that makes perfect sense in a way as a kind of amalgamation of minimalism and expressionism, which is coming out uh, in these pictures. Um, they are, they're very organized, although within that and around that there is chaos, like this, you know, this wonderful sort of spiky tree right next to that rigid verticality of her left arm. Right. 
And let me tell you one other thing about the oh, Russia yeah. Surg. <laughs> yeah. Russia Surg, I was at the at the beginning of my studies in, in New York, I was in love with Jasper Johns and Russian works. And I love mm -hmm. the gray that they used, the brush strokes that they used. So I I got I got involved with that so much that I tried to 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 take them in mm. and work mm. with them. So that's that's coming from that day. Huh. Interesting. Yeah, because I mean John sort of owns that monochromatic treatment. Right. We saw that in the Whitney version of his retrospective, not in the Philadelphia version, but the Whitney version from last year opened up with that whole room of monochromatic works. Um, that was, you know, I thought it was an interesting way to start the show, maybe not totally effective, but it did give you a sense of the, of what he was working with, trying to do in that period. So here's another work. Uh, they emerged triumphantly at the left, the full image, and at the right, one of these uh, details. And these pictures really do uh, elicit your desire to sort of look at them in detail. And then as a whole and somehow you've managed to combine all these very disparate elements into a picture which really does does communicate as a totality and again here's another one of these uh, compartmentalizations that we we're talking about which go back to Islam, uh iranian miniatures and then you know these sort of guns and things which are on the one hand sort of obvious references to the conflict happening in Iran, but also they remind me of film noir sort of stills and uh, whenever you see black and white images of sort of movie stills, uh, Hollywood and a kind of um, mechanized and uh, entertainment based violence, which is so much part of the media. Is uh, again, as you as you correctly said, this was a the chaos that was happening in Iran. I try to bring it together and see. I, I had no idea what I, what I am doing. I was so busy with this, with everything that I try to use as much as I can. But in, uh, for example, this one, this one is uh, again the this part of this painting is based on clouds in the miniature uh, so but it's down at the bottom here it's on the top oh at the top sir the top sir then yeah, yeah, I see. on the on this side is the uh, again this part of the miniatures coming with the animal then we have this group which actually i took it from the newspaper is uh, mm -hmm is the people that they 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 were happy after right after the revolution who went after the Shah left. But the my disappointment with the whole thing was I have to do something that makes it a little bit more um, as a uh, make the whole thing as a as an orchestra. And here is the guy playing the violin for the whole thing that's mm. happening. Yeah, and I noticed in the other work that the image of Sarah, she has on her arm this sort of hatching scarification and you've, you've pulled that into this picture as well. Okay. Kind of sim symbol of, you know, a sort of damage, both visible and I guess internal. Sure. And the horse is, of course, a, a, a constituent element which really sticks out in this work. Horse also ahead, Nick, is, is the horse of uh, Iranian miniature. Their, their horse mm -hmm. is uh, very deformed and elegant. Mm -hmm. So uh, here I I have it as a dark um, and big. Is coming like from the water. It just uh, I don't, I can't put any any meaning of it. But um, that was the feeling. made probably something against again that revolution because uh, 
the horse was is black in black and uh, usually jumping around nicely and but this one is is either going down the water or just sort of coming up so yeah yeah and is in line with the revolver you know and that that is something that you do notice in these works is that may not be intentional but when you start to look at them because they are not based on anything literary so they're not literally narratives right so you make your own story no matter who you are but then you start to see things like the revolver this line of the ribbon and pointing straight at the horse elements begin to sort of coalesce from disparate sections of the composition and remember oh. as i said these are most of the painting is really based off part on reality that was going on i had right. and also based off the imagination because i didn't want to be a, a realistic painting paint the revolution you see is the most yeah. kind of combination of these two elements that sometimes works works together sometimes doesn't yeah and also can be read by different people in different ways right different so ways. absolutely the horse you know from my western eyes reminds me of something very different maybe than someone from the middle east or you know would would perceive it immediately as something related to miniatures um which are part of that tradition when i look at it i think of course of other works of art which function as protests and more than that you know yelps of rage against injustice and um revolution and despair and desolation so the horse the famous horse in picasso's guernica and then also the, the orientation of uh, the woman with the dead child here on the left. No, this uh, this was one of my model. Not that I I was interested in Cubism. I liked Cubism a lot, mm. but um, and I always wanted to say, okay, I can do something similar to that, but that's impossible. There, there was nothing that <laughs> I could come close to it. But I I did, you know this is this is the way I. I did it. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think you know the idea of a sort of inspiration is you know it's a form of confidence. I think to be using these elements and know that they're going to be read on one level um, in your work. I think that's that's what gives this whole series, 1981, uh, a real level of strength. So let's look very briefly before we open it up to questions at a couple of the smaller works in the back room. This is from a series that you call Hope and Anarchy, also from 1981. How many works are there Are there in this series? Before I do those, uh, in 1981, before I do those large work, I did the small yeah. These are the, mm -hmm. this is right after I came back to the United States and much more, um, the images were alive in my mind. So mm -hmm. I did this in this uh, smaller scale. And as you see, they are darker in the palette. Uh, there are more uh, images of uh, people dying, people in the shreds, uh, all the um, it, it's um, is more related to the actual thing that happened in Iran. But again, as you see in this image, um, this is set in the Iranian miniature more than the large one. But the the thing is, um, it's darker. It's really dark. When I saw it after many years, I thought, wow, it's, it's been very dark. And the reason was, I was so disappointed that uh, um, before I started painting, I blacked the background. The background was painted black. Huh. 
So yeah. I painted all this thing on the black, that, and that's why it uh, gives you kind of a dark palette to it. But you see more of the people, how they've been deformed, how they were shot, the woman, how they carry out the thing. Yeah. These are more related to the reality of the uh, revolution. Then after this, there is an there is image, I think you correctly picked up the detail of it when I have the I have closed my eyes uh, in one of the painting, and that's uh, that's the end of the paint. Uh, that's the end of this series because I I got tired. I you know I was so um, so it was so dark and didn't want to see it anymore that I closed my eyes and had my my hand over it, and that means that that chapter was closed. Then I started the, the new larger painting, which is brighter and more, more of uh, imagination into it rather than the reality. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. Um, I don't have that work in the in the presentation. I put it on my Instagram. Uh, but yeah, it's an image of just. Kind of, I assume that was you, sort of covering yes. your face and just. Yes. You know, it's it's like the Goya. Uh, you can't bear to look, the idea of the disasters of war, you just can't bear to look. And then it's interesting that that was the that was the end of this particular series for you. And then you can move into something else because certainly works like the one on the left are, are very graphic and expressionistic and expressionists, are, you know, in a sense that's different from neo-expressionism of Bazalitz and other artists um, in the period because it really does refer to the, the German expressionist Franz Marx and his Mark, sorry, M A R C, and his use of horses as a stand-in for the uh, world and human condition. Um, the forms of Gabriela Munter and uh, Vasily Kandinsky, we see that very strongly in these pictures. And then the kind of despair in the bodies, and then that light bulb, which of course you see in Picasso's in Guernica, and uh, you know some of these have a real sort of contemporary swagger. I would say, like the picture on the left from the same series, the light bulb is retained. It has those cross hatched, those sort of hatched red lines, which we've talked about, um, beasts, uh, the bracketing of forms, images. This looks like, reminds me of Leon Golub's images of bodies and yeah, strife from the same, a little bit earlier, um, protest pictures. And then these uh, characters, um, who are drawn, I assume, from your memories of the of the protest in in Iran before you moved to the U.S. Also, one thing that, about this painting is this series of the painting is uh, one element of the uh, light bulb, mm. and again. We go back to when I was studying Neo. I got in. I got in touch with the works of uh, Francis Bacon. Right. And I love it. And one element that I picked up from, um, uh, actually, a couple of things I I like about the work was one was this uh, lamp. Uh, that is in every painting that not every painting that he does there is a, a light bulb is coming down uh, mm -hmm. so for some reason i like that and i put it put it here so it makes sense that in the darkness of this area maybe we need the light uh, for it and mm -hmm. the other thing that i i notice is now that i I use in the recent painting. I use a lot of red as a as a dot, sort of splash or something that's happening on the painting. But here mm -hmm. we can see um, there are some of it with the brush happening in the painting, which is which yeah. is also interesting that I I can I still can use it, you know, for some in a different. Yeah. 
That's right. Still that sort of splattering, splattering. that we've seen and that we've seen in the other works. Well, the light bulb, um, Francis Bacon is one thing, but I was that also was... thinking of Philip Guston. Gustin. Gustin, who is so much in the air right now. Of course, the show, which was in Boston at the MFA, has now moved to Houston, um, where it looks more interesting, I would say. It was very difficult in, at Boston to navigate and um, it was so apologetic. But uh, the studio was there as it was at Hauser and Worth last year in that show of works by Gustin. And that light bulb um, hanging there in this image, uh, which is a self-portrait of him in a Klansman's a hat, which is, of course, a reference to Picasso, and then connects to so many different yeah. artists. But here I brought exactly. them all together. And the greatest bit about the Gustin is that the light bulb, almost like it's dripping, you know, the light of illumination and, and uh, enlightenment as if it's dripping into the scene and just about to hit his hand. Let me right. go back for a second. Right under the brush, right? So right. it's so clever right. here, this image. The wonderful thing. Um, somehow I, I was just interested to see them, to see them and I, I, I thought that I should use it. Yeah, oh, it's such a potent motif in, in all these works as the, you know, it's a, the incandescent light bulb without a shade, which nonetheless doesn't really get rid of the darkness. Instead, it just magnifies it uh, even more, it feels like. You're using it very potently. So before I get to this, let me just ask you, um, Nikki, what is it like to see all these works again? These works from 1981, which were obviously such a fraught moment for you and of course your people. Uh, I haven't seen them for a long time. So right. I, I usually, I'm afraid to look at the, look at my past work. Is, uh, I'm afraid always to look at them um, because I, right away, I, I see um, the, the mistake. I see the, the thing that is mismatched. And I see those things right away. It, uh, it's, it's so, it's bothering. Um, <laughs> but when I saw when, especially when, Put up when you saw the show. I carefully look at them. They didn't look too bad. They look yeah. really. They don't. They don't look too bad. Uh, <laughs> uh, the composition is good. You know the thing. Uh, the relevancy is amazing. So I, I like them. <laughs> yeah, well, that's that's reassuring. That's reassuring. I mean, it's it's such a tragedy that you lost those 128, some 125 paintings and drawings that were in the exhibit at the Museum of Contemporary Art in Tehran and that were never returned to you. And I was reading that you had made some inquiries about it. And apparently some of them are there, but they're, of course, inaccessible. And uh, someday, let's hope, you'll be able to reconnect with some of them. And I, I it will be interesting to see how uh, you respond to your earlier work, which already had this kind of critical edge. Right. So just looking at the paintings and looking at the, the material that you're making now, I just thought we'd bring it a little bit to the present because it's a little bit unavoidable if we're keeping an eye on, as I'm sure you are, the news coming out of uh, Iran and what's been happening recently um, since uh, September 16th when uh, Masha Amini, a 22-year-old Kurd was killed in custody um, of the morality police because uh, she was wearing her hijab incorrectly. And it has led to a remarkable and sustained uprising, uh, largely fomented by women in Iran against the Islamic Republic. Um, and it's still going on daily. And, uh, you know, how, how, how are you sort of feeling about this and responding to it. And, and also just want to note some of the things we're seeing in the media about it and that kind of, you know, these video captures and images and, um, and Instagram, uh, Instagram posts, et cetera. This one from the Times of last week, November 15th. Now, first of all, it's, it's just amazing how this uh, um, 
young, brave women and young guys fighting the such a brutal government that is un unmatched, uh, at least in our, uh, our history. And is every as you mentioned is is going on and it's getting worse and worse, and uh, I totally stand by this this amazing people that fighting this brutal regime. You know, one thing that um, I have to tell you from the moment that I was disappointed in the first revolution, fifty nine fifty. 79, I was hoping and I worked for it that I could see such a day. Mm -hmm. uh, in, a, in a few months ago, I wouldn't even imagine that something like this would happen. I would, I would tell everybody, and before I die, I want to see the change. That would be my my desire and, and so you can imagine how I feel that the, this is happening I, mean, I am totally with it uh, I support it and I work for it I've been working for it for the last 45 years I have done many many posters for supporting the, this revolution uh, headed by the young, brave woman of Iran. So it's just, um, and follow, I mean, these days uh, we are all involved with it. We are trying to do as anything we can. Uh, yeah. Uh, I can't do painting, I am trying to, uh, actually I did probably 10 posters supporting the revolution, supporting the woman life, uh, uh, freedom uh, but none of the poor none of the images are new all the images that I did is I made it like 25 years ago 20 years ago yeah oh, oh, interesting I'm even thinking that someday at this time I can use it I'm not doing anything I'm not doing anything I use those images that I I did against Khamenei or I, I did against uh, brutality of the regime. Right. It's just amazing. It's just uh, one of one of the most, in, and I think it's one of the most revolution that happened in the world up to now. Right. So we right. all somehow we have to support it and try to get rid of this amazing, amazingly corrupt. Regime. Yes, thank you for that. Um, you know, it's inspirational, really. I mean, Khomeini has been supreme leader since 1989, 33 years, and he is 83 years old. And I think Generation Z is sort of more than tired of being told what to do by 80 year old men. Um, we are more than happy to see what 80 year old artists are doing, but uh, politicians are a different order. And I'm interested to read some of the really good reporting by Robin Wright in the New Yorker about this, that in fact, the regime has sort of created the means for dissent because female literacy has risen from 30% in 1976 to 80% now because of the women who have been going to higher education and colleges, and there are a majority now, and where all the protests are sort of orienting from the 100 plus uh, universities. They're tech savvy. They're socially active. It's a really fascinating situation. And it, you know, absolutely demands all our support. Wright calls it legalized gender apartheid in Iran. And you see people, you know, fighting for their lives. And it's appalling to see the regime crowing about the fact that th that the people they're arresting are average age 15, that they're proud of it. But that just gives you a sense of how you know, in a country here where 27% of people under 25 voted, here you have 
kids who are from nine to 20 who are putting their lives on the line to try to change their world. It's mind boggling the way they cracking down on the children. Yeah. And adults, especially young, young women, young guys, 16, yeah. 17, 15. Uh, there was an article in New York Times. They they targeted the eyes of the people. The, mm -hmm. In one hospital, the report says about 500 people came. They brought to the hospital in a few days. Most of them at least blinded with, with one, one eye. And that shows how brutal the regime is that they they intentionally targeted the eyes. This is unusual. This is a, haven't seen, you haven't seen anything like that. Right. This it goes back to Hammurabi. Like, you know, it's, it's ancient. It is horrific. Our duty is everybody's duty is to just get rid of them. Just the eyes. Yeah. Like, yeah. You're trying to get the attention of the American, European, especially to politician, to not to interfere in terms of you know um, going to Iran and get rid of them, but they condemn this brutality and not to support them in any way. Yeah, yeah. So you see on this screen here, one of the young victims of the morality police. And then on the right, a scene yesterday from Qatar at the World Cup match between Iran and England uh, and the protest signs of people holding up. Um, and I want to ask you about this and then we'll move to the questions uh, because you know the idea that I have read in some places that the people in the country don't support the football team, the, the national team, because they see them as sort of you know, puppets of the regime to a degree. But on the other hand, yesterday, none of them sang the national anthem. So how did that read? How does that read to you? I'm actually, I'm, I'm in support of the team, not mm -hmm. because they are, uh, they are affiliated with the regime. I think they show, at least most of them, they are not supporting the regime. But remember, right. they're working. They are part of the uh, part of the part of the regime, but doesn't belong to the regime. It belongs to the people of Iran, and yeah. whatever happened to them is for Iranian people. At the end, we can, you know, say these are the our team. But the other, yeah. the, other, the, the other side would say no, we shouldn't, we shouldn't support them and let them down. I don't think we should. I think we should support them. And the reason is, we started yesterday at the beginning of the ceremony when they uh, this, uh, the anthem of uh, Iran was played. None of them. None of them sang, sang. none of yeah. them showed any happy space. And also the captain of the team also, before, this, before the game started, he talked about how he is and the rest of the team are with the Iranian people. Uh, they support Iranian people. So that's one mm -hmm. side of it. The other side, they have to be part of the regime to come and uh, play otherwise, uh, they'd be either in jail or they won't. They wouldn't be able to work. Right, right. And the national anthem, I should point out, was something that wasn't adopted until 1990. It replaced the previous national anthem of the reign of the Shah. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, fo football is a, a great barometer of politics. This World Cup, as as criminal as it may be, the reason why it's there and the way that the buildings were made. Um, is still an opportunity to expose uh, these kinds of things and, and you know, support football's life, as they say. And I, I find it quite interesting also that 
uh, women in Iran are not allowed to go to football matches, soccer matches, right. but have been sneaking in, have been sneaking in. They put on fake beards. They'll tie up their torsos to go to watch the matches. And this is something that happened in ancient Greece, in Olympia, where women would sneak into the matches dressed as men. And what was the reaction? The reaction of the regime in Greece was to insist that everyone went to matches naked so that you could not sneak in as a woman. So all the spectators at the Olympic Games in ancient Olympia and the athletes were naked. I don't think the regime is going to condone that. But we are thinking about the people of Iran as they're working to uh, get rid of their corrupt government. And, you know, to that end, sorry, sorry go ahead, Nikki, uh, thanks. Go ahead. Remember, every time the football in Iran, soccer in Iran, they won, there was a demonstration against the regime. So yeah. the football by itself is an instrumental against the regime. That's why the regime is really afraid of them. They do everything to not to let them to do anything that is uh, yeah. demonstra demonstration to to the people. So yeah. we have uh, at least I I support them because they genuinely they are at least most of them are against the yeah. and we yeah, have okay. to support. Them. Yeah, well, we wish them luck on Friday against Wales. I will. <laughs> <laughs> and just to end up, two more images and then I'll turn it over to questions. Sorry we've gone over a little long, but I really appreciate your um, honest answers and, and discussion of what's going on in your in your country, uh, former country. Um, just a few details here of some of the remarkable faces and heads in the series that's on view now on the Bowery um, and uh, from the, uh, the earlier uh, smaller series. And then it made me think of works like Jerry Coe's um, images of bodies and figures from the morgue uh, from 1819. And these paintings by the French romantic artists, of course, led to the raft of the Medusa of 1819. And that idea of history painting as political protest um, is something which you know has been with us for centuries. And I applaud you for finding in it a new potency in works like We the Witnesses and the works in 1981, the show that is up now. So I'll just leave it at that. Thank you so much, Nikki, uh, for today. Um, I really appreciate the conversation. I look forward to uh, hearing your answers to some of the questions and to seeing you know future shows. Uh, I'm very grateful to you for, for today. Thank you. Thank you, Jason. You've been, you've been great. Thank you. I appreciate it. I'll turn it over to, uh, to uh, Carolyn and Chloe. Thanks. Great. Thank you so much, Jason and Nikki. This has been incredible. Um, so for, let's see, we're just, we're going to take a question from our friend GE today. Um, go ahead. You should be able to unmute. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Jason. And thank you so much, Nikki. Um, Nikki, your deep, deep commitment to your art has always been an inspiration to me uh, as a writer. Um, but especially as it seems to be a commitment to creation from cradle to grave, which sometimes we don't see as much with artists and writers. Is this how you feel? And when did you arrive at that resolution, if that's the case? I'm sorry, you repeat the question. I didn't get it. So oh, oh, sure. Larry, go ahead. Absolutely. Uh, it, 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 I, I've always been been inspired by your 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 deep, you know, commitment that your art has always had, and it seems to be a deep commitment that you've had to creation from cradle to grave. Um, and is this the way you feel? And how did you arrive at that resolution? It's so rare today. Sometimes, um, if I correctly understand your question, my my motto for painting is is deep. I've been since very young childhood. I was interested in the painting, and I I was a bad student at the school. I never did anything else. I I just painted and painted and painted. And that's how 
That's all I can say. There is uh, nothing to stop. I appreciate that so much. Thank you. And I love the unfettered light of that naked light bulb. So, which we need everywhere. It throws freedom of light everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, GE, for that question. Um, so I think just for time, we're, we're going to move to our closing poetry reading um, because we are so honored to have Natasha Rao here with us today. Um, Natasha Rao is the author of Latitude, which was selected by Ada Limon as the winner of the 2021 APR Honickman First Book Prize, the recipient of a 2021 Ruth Lilly and Dorothy Sargent Rosenberg Fellowship from the Poetry Foundation. She has also received fellowships from Breadloaf, the Vermont Studio Center, and the Community of Writers. Her work appears in the American Poetry Review, the New York Times Magazine, among many others. She holds a BA from Brown University and an MFA from NYU, where she was a Goldwater Fellow, and she currently serves as an editor of American Chordata. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Natasha, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Carolyn, and thank you, Nikki and Jason. That was amazing. I was taking a lot of notes, and now I feel ready to write some poems about these incredible paintings. Um, so I will just read a few poems from the, um, the book, Latitude. As, I, as you were talking, Nikki, I was flipping through and I remembered I have a few poems that kind of talk about painting. So I think I will read those toward the end. Um, okay. This first one is called What It Was Like. We had sushi that was so fresh, we blushed. Every 17 years, the cicadas rasped a kind of warning, showed us with increasing urgency the need to leave our old bodies behind. I thought I could make some kind of difference. I thought I could memorize enough facts to stay composed in debates and not cry after one glass of wine when my brother says, we can all just go to Mars. I thought what I did was forgivable in the grand scheme of things, that your love was an inexhaustible resource. Terrible people made terrible decisions. Good people made terrible decisions. Which was I? It depended on the color of light in the bathroom, the angle at which I held my face to the mirror. I lived in a city at sea level, See, level-headed now, the frailty underfoot. We pretended not to notice. We loved receiving shipments to our home, ceremoniously slashing packages with scissors, cleaving, leaving nothing but confetti. It was like sitting across from you at dinner and wondering when to tell you, knowing the worst is coming and simply ordering another drink. Meanwhile, the bubbles in the glass keep rising. It was luxurious. It was inevitable. It was a thick piece of fatty tuna brimming with mercury, somehow effortless to swallow. Uh, and then, so I have a couple poems in the book that are, um, it's a series that's called For a, and then the color of a page. So kind of thinking about, um, painting a little bit in color and trying to play with that in the poem. So this one is called For a Gray Page. Achromatic exhale, thinned glossy, then wet. When I see Van Eyck's gray angels, I want to pleat myself into stone. Grisaille, the private underpainting, secret I know to be true. The real me, a naked monochrome layer of oil. A monk dons his gray robe of humility, the same instant I unhook my bra for the portrait. My mouth all ash, memory gravel. A mouse, an elephant, a blackout, all swim in the gray matter of my mind. So often these days, rendered glass-like. I would like for a moment 
to be vapor, ink wash, a hailstone melting unnoticed. Um, and then in that series, I'll just read one other short one, which is for Blue Page. Tonight, I am remembering the Krishna skin skies of summer and the way your laugh made a jacaranda tree bloom. We slept in sheets the color of sea glass and I woke with the taste of salt in my mouth. Happiness is devastating in the past tense. I lay these memories like a fish on the cutting board, slice them open and the deepest blue spills onto this poem. Um, and I think I'll just, for the time's sake, maybe do one last one. Um, this, let's see, which one do I wanna end on? Uh, okay, this one is called Divine Transformation. Watching Jane nuns sweep peacock feathers across the earth, I wanted to become one of them. I was pupil shifting in the uniform of my larval skin. The nuns practice ultimate nonviolence, brushing the floor with fallen feathers, cotton broom, unbleached wool to avoid bruising any insect. It was, to me, an obvious way to live before I saw myself as small, inelastic. I was large with guilt. Why girl, why not mouse, moth? My mother asked, where do you see yourself in 10 years? And I said, barefoot, forest floor, fostering compassion, wearing a muslin cloth over my mouth to avoid swallowing some winged thing. I didn't auspicate the apartment in Brooklyn, sponging blood from mosquitoes off my wall. Could not imagine I would cultivate a new cruelty not just obvious roach spray and rat trap, but killing the unobjectionable, gnats and fruit flies who inhabit this arbitrary world for just a breath. Last week, I ate exclusively the unborn, salmon roe and quail egg in one luscious bite. The distance between what I thought I was and what I am grows. I could have been a kind of fly. I could have been kind. Thank you so much. That's incredible. Thank you so very much, Natasha. Um, thank you all for joining today. Thank you, of course, Nikki and Jason for this talk. Um, we would also like to thank the Terra Foundation for sponsoring our NSC program and making these daily conversations possible. You can view today's event and our full archive on the Rails YouTube channel. Um, for the past 22 years, the Brooklyn Rail has provided a platform for the arts, culture, and politics through our monthly publication and public events, like here in our daily NSC. You can check a chat, uh, the chat for a link to donate to support our operations here. And as we head into the holidays this Wednesday through Friday, we hope you'll join us for screenings in collaboration with Michael Blackwood Productions. Tomorrow's screening for which registrants will receive a 24 hour link and password will be Conversations with Philip Gustin, directed by Michael Blackwood and presented on the occasion of Philip Gustin now currently on view at MFAH Houston. And as is tradition, you can now turn your microphone on and say hello and goodbye as you leave. Thank you all again so much for coming. Thank you so much. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you, Jason. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. 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 Thank you.